Thank you for turning to page 121. Today we're going to take a look back at a uh, long time ago, October 1982 to be exact, and Dragon number 166. This issue came out in October of 1982. It's 40 years old this month. And uh, we're going to thumb through it and see what made Dragon such a great magazine to be buying back at that time. Front and then the back, nice ad for gangbusters there. I haven't opened up this one in a while. Uh, excited about thumbing through it. I uh, hope you guys like these these videos about the, the old dragons. I do. I really enjoy uh, going back and taking a look at the old dragons and reading the articles and such. So today on page 121, a walk back in time, 40 years in fact, to October 1982, dragon number 66. Any viewer who has a cat that allows you to share their house will understand what I'm going through. As I'm trying to make this video, I had a little visitor. This is my buddy Wally. Say hi, Wally. Wally is uh, going to be 13 in a few weeks. And he's my good buddy, aren't you? So there you go. Some of the pains of living with a cat. I live with two. Caesar's my other cat. I'll film him sometime. He's been on one or two of my videos already. Wally. Wally. Hey, buddy. Wally. Yeah, he knows what the camera is. He doesn't look. <laughs> All right. So it's October 1982. I'm standing at the uh, my friendly hobby store, which was probably Models Hobbies in Crestwood, Illinois at the time. And he was the guy that uh, his hobby store sponsored that club we used to belong to. M-O-T-T-L was his last name, Mottl. Uh, I thought he should have named it Mottl's Models myself, but... Uh, anyway, I've got Dragon 66 in my hand, $3 burning a hole in my pocket, and I'm learning to speak Thieves Can't in this issue, and Illusionist Spells. Thieves Can't? Why, of course they can. <laughs> so I didn't know much about Thieves Can't at the time, and pre-internet, you had to go to encyclopedias to look stuff up, and I had looked up what a Thieves Can't was, and it's basically just a, a language made up by a local group of thieves so they could talk amongst themselves. So slaying monsters should be mostly fun and games. So here we have Epic's Computer Games Thinker. Game, computer Games Thinkers Play. Wow, a computer game. Uh, I only knew one guy who had a computer at the time. Actually, in 82, I didn't even know him that well. Uh, I didn't see his computer until, I think, 83 or 84. Uh, they were pretty primitive then, but wow, pretty exciting. Rollmaster, Character Law. I never owned Character Law or Claw Law. Uh, spell law, any of the, the various role master books. I played in one game uh, with the DM who used this. It was not to my liking, but hey, if you like the Iron Crown Enterprises various law books, you know, let me know. I don't have any of them. I've got the role master space master game. That's it. So there we go. The table of contents. Woo, wee hee. Thieves can't pick uh, pocket dictionary. This I'll, I'll talk about when we get there, but I use that a bunch. Uh, and then weapons for spell users and all kinds of other goodies here. And then we have an editorial by Kim Moan. And then a letters to the editor out on a limb. Uh, some of these are pretty interesting and you could actually get some magic items and spells out of some of these letters to the editor. Always worth looking at. And then Come to Middle Earth by Iron Crown Enterprises. They held the license at the time. Held it for a lot of time. High Adventure in the Starfleet Universe. Starline 2200 from Task Force Games. Wow, this the dragon at the time was just so much of your your gateway to other things you you might not have noticed or looked at at the hobby store. Uh, I really like the ads in this. So, uh, should magic users be able to use forbidden weapons but with decreased damage? Yes or no? Should they wait? They have an edge. Yes or no? I don't know. I'm I didn't use much out of this article simply because I think the magic users should be restricted. For what weapons and damage they can do. Simply because they do have an advantage in spells. Convention schedule. I usually just breeze past that. Because in 1982 I wasn't really in a position to go to a lot of cons. Uh, and then of course. Sit and drool. Over the lead figures. Yes these were made of lead. Over the lead figures that they have here. I had this set. Or I have this set. Uh, I think I have him. I think that's all I have out of these. this Ralph Partha. Uh article. ElfQuest, a fantasy comic characters fleshed out for AD&D play. I never played ElfQuest. I never read the comic book. 
Uh, it just didn't grab me. I was very aware of it, and I, I remember reading this article. Um, but it was nothing that really... Uh, well, I was very interested in. It's a graphic novel by Wendy and Richard Pinney. And uh, there have been a bunch of things done you know, in the years since then. Uh, just something, nothing that ever grabbed me. Uh, Steve Jackson, Illuminati, the game of conspiracy. And then you can form your cabal. And I always looked at the lists of hobby stores because I'd go to Illinois, which is where I live and lived then. And I'd look at ones that might be around my area. Dragonfire over in Cicero is not terribly far from you. Waukegan's a pretty fair hike. Games Plus, look at that. Games Plus will be holding an event there for Traveler on the 6th. Uh, Hobby Chest in Skokie, Illinois, pretty far away. Round Lake, Illinois, pretty far away. So uh, the only one near me really was Dragonfire, and then I've, I've become a frequent uh, shopper at Games Plus. Great game store. I recommend you get there. They've been there over 40 years. Uh, phenomenal game store. Sage advice, Gary Gygax, uh, he'll let us know what we can and can't do. I actually, it wasn't always Gary Gygax, so it was sometimes Gary Gygax. It doesn't credit who wrote this one. Um, I liked games, Sage advice. I always read it because you got a lot of good tips and uh, advice out of that, especially in the early days of D&D &D, pre-internet. If we had questions, there, there were very few sources to find the answers. The Traveler book. Ooh, Traveler, yay, love Traveler. Man, Myth, and Magic. I became aware of the Traveler book, I think through an article like this, or through an ad like this, uh, and eventually did pick it up. Traveler book is just a larger version, larger print version of the uh, Traveler books themselves. So the idea, the core rule book that came in the little black box, you got this in one bound book. And uh, yeah, Quinto Publications, new release of Man, Myth, and Magic. I'm not familiar with that guy. RAFM, Siege Equipment. I always wanted some of this stuff. I especially wanted the Siege Ladders. Uh, never bought them. Some refuse to die in the aftermath. So we continue with our Sage Advice. And now we go to Featured Creatures by Gary Gygax. This was kind of neat. I used these at the time in 82. These are the genies of other uh, ilks. So the genie that we were all familiar with is, of course, from the elemental plane of air. These are from Earth, Fire, Water. Uh, very excited to see, you know, Jan, Dale, Merids. And also by Gary Gygax, new spells for illusionists. Pretty exciting to uh, have new spells at any time in the early 80s, especially if they were official from Gary Gygax. And we put these into our campaign immediately. Pretty good spells in here. I'll cover the spells more in detail as I talk more about the illusionists in a future video. Coming through here. The RPGA. I don't know why I never joined the RPGA. I, it's something that would have been right up my alley. I was aware of it. I just never joined it. I really don't know. Why. I did join it in 2000 at the advent of 3rd edition and got some very nice premiums from them. Uh, but I, I don't know why I didn't join it back in the day. Is it really real? Be careful with Phantasmal Force. Illusions can kill if used with skill. But fake healing is only a feeling. By Tom, Ar Tom Armstrong. Nice little artwork there. Use this article a lot. Phantasmal Force is one of those very difficult to DM powers in AD&D. &D. And uh, believe me, any help I could get with illusion stuff, I took. The spells earlier and this, definitely. Phantasmal Force is potentially one of the most powerful things in the game. Familiarity factor pre uh, prevents illusionists from stealing the shell. I, basically, what this is saying is that you have to, this illusionist has to know its subject as it creates a convincing illusion. Uh, more on that when we talk about the illusionist. I have strong feelings on that. <laughs> Thieves Can't, a primer for the language of larceny by Aurelio Loxen, or Losen, sorry if I mispronounced your name, gentlemen, sir. Uh, this was very useful. We used the heck out of the Thieves Can't book. Uh, I actually would do cryptic messages in Thieves Can't. The players would find, and then the, the thief himself might get a chance at it, and I'd give him a percentage to look it up. And I would always have the translation written in my notes. And uh, this is kind of nice. Obviously, I did not cut up the dictionary and make it. But I did go thr through and use. So, you know, if I wanted to lock to, to, it's a spider. Ooh. And Thieves Camp is subject to dialect. If I'm a thief from Greyhawk and I'm over in Ernst, uh, the Thieves Camp may be very similar. 
But if I'm, you know, way, way over in the Great Kingdom, uh, in North Province, for instance, my thieves can't going to be very different and very tough to, for me to decipher. So there you have the thieves can't. Like I said, I use the heck out of this thing. I still pop it out now and again. It's been a while. Uh, don't jump. The latest dragon can be found. Yeah, why not? Language leaves lot rules leave lots of room for creativity in your campaign. So basically, how you want to craft your languages. This was not something I used a bunch. I absolutely understand it. I read the article and I didn't pull a lot from it. I'm not a linguist. I only speak one language. That, despite being refused of German in high school, uh, I speak one language. Fantasy f uh, philology, playing in the fluency percentages. So basically, again, dialects, uh, accents, things like that. Uh, I get comments periodically on some people really get a kick out of my Midwest accent, my Chicago accent. Uh, and the funny thing is, I don't consider that I really have much of a Chicago accent. My oldest brother, who lived in the south of Chicago and in the south suburbs his whole life, we grew up in the same house together, he's about eight years older than me, has a very pronounced Chicago accent. Uh, I don't consider that I have a very pronounced one, but I understand that I do. Uh, Old Dwarvish is still new to scholars of language lore. Lots of language stuff in this, and I did use some of this to create different uh, sigils and things like that, or uh, different missives that they found in dungeons. I still use it periodically. Some new monsters from low levels from Lund Kafka from Leoman's Tiny Hut. I like these, the Compsagnathus. Sag First time I saw Compsagnathus. Next time, of course, Jurassic Park 2. Miniature animals. The vulture, carnivorous flying squirrel. That's more of a Gamma World kind of thing, but I like it. Uh, animal skeletons. Those pop up a lot in my game. I like animal skeletons. And then we have a nice ad for Different Worlds magazine. I think I've had one or two copies of that in my life. Weapons and armor from Palladium. Palladium had a nice system. I was always interested in it, but it was always one of those where I just didn't have the money at the time. And I never bought Palladium. Uh, I always understood it to be a really good system, but I also knew my player group. They would not have played it. They were D&D diehards with some Traveler and some Champions thrown in and the occasional Gamma World. That was the bulk of the core. Uh, there were a few guys that I could pull aside and we'd play other games with. And we did play some Top Secret and stuff like that. But And there were a few guys that were fellow DMs that I could talk into playing other types of games. Uh, but by and large, we just stuck with the basic stuff. Up on a soapbox, individuals make a difference. And it talks about that you want to really kind of personalize your various encounters and your player. Does your Vorpal Blade go snicker-snack, or does it just snicker? <laughs> it's like the Bandersnatch Leathers ad. Uh, cosmic Encounter Science Fiction Gaming at its best. Never played that one. Valley of the Root of Parth from Judge's Guild. It's funny. I always loved the Judge's Guild Traveler stuff. I was never a big fan of the Judge's Guild D&D stuff. I have a couple of pieces by them. Uh, it just never never spoke to me. I think because the TSR quality was very much ahead of what Judges Guild was doing. And Games Designers Workshop quality was higher than uh, Judges Guild. I just don't know why. It just it never resonated for me for D&D, but absolutely did for Traveler. Uh, Daredevils have adventures. I was aware of Daredevils. I've never played it. Handmade Sterling Silver Pendants. Wizards and Lizards, the finest 25mm fantasy figures. Those are kind of nice looking. Uh, Phineas Captured. Yes, you could get Phineas the Thief. Uh, complete Wizard Outfit. $70. $70 in 1982 was a ton of money. Okay, and then we got Game Master Hobbies Incorporated. Uh, Super Filet Wars. Don't know that one. Looking for something. Uh, War Games and West. Hmm. The 1982 Module Design Competition. Who of us didn't sit, sit down and say yes? This year, I'm going to design a module, and I'm sending it in. I never did. I designed plenty. I usually just ended up playing them. Space opera. <laughs> I keep talking about space opera. It's a lot of time for me to invest to, to be able to, to show you space opera, and I will. I have it. I have a, a lot of space opera stuff. We played it a few times. It definitely, to me, was inferior to Traveler, uh, just in, in ep production everything else, but... That being said, there's a ton of stuff you can pull out of space opera. Citadel Miniatures U.S. 
The Medievals. There you go. You can send away for them. <clears throat> Star Trek, the correspondence game. Never played it. And then we get some off the shelf. I did like this. It would give you an opportunity to take a look at some books. Science fiction and fantasy weren't really featured in a lot of reviews at the time. You know, in the papers and magazines. So to get it in something like this was pretty good. And then, of course, here we have something for Star Trek, The Wrath of Khan, the pocket book from 1982. And, uh, wow. Go it alone with Star, Str Star Smuggler. Uh, not familiar with that one? And then an open letter to Rick Loomis. I don't really remember that. Friends in High Places with Grav Ball. I remember seeing this advertised by FASA, Fredonian Aerospace Administration. They would go on. They were a traveler uh, licensee, and they would go on to create Battletech. Uh, unless you're an elf, you want dwarves, a complete kingdom and adventure for Rollades. I actually did buy a fair amount of Rollades back in the day. Uh, and while I found that I wouldn't have played Rollades, I absolutely adapted a lot of stuff out of it. We have the Wizard's Corner uh, Game Center in Canada. Logan's Run, unique play-by-mail. Thieves Guild goes to sea from Game Lords. Here we go. Uh, adventurers experience the fantasy wave. You get some clothing. And then totally revealing the official complete guide to an alien race. A RuneQuest box set from Troll Pack. Hmm, I don't know that one. Realms of Wonder. The 1983 calendar. Be sure to get your 1983 calendar. Uh, you want to know what time of day it is or what, what day of the week it is, rather. Get your 1983 calendar with the Brothers Hildebrandt. I actually always liked their artwork. Well, this is just Tim Hildebrandt. Uh... Some beautiful artwork from those guys. And, of course, what's new? Yes, I'm guilty. Very often I would just go ahead and drop to the back and read the comics. So I always enjoyed what's new. And then, of course, Wormy. Dave Trampier artwork, what's not to love. I got some definite inspiration here and there from uh, Wormy for some of my games. Three nice pages. It's a shame it was never really followed up and fi finished. And then we have the... Grenadier Models box sets. I love these. I've got about three or four of them. Uh, and I've got a, a bunch of the uh, a bunch of loose ones because as people dropped out of D&D, &D, I inherited various collections. And then an ad for Gangbusters, the D &D, or TSR Crime Buster game set in the 1920s. So there you have it. <clears throat> On to the mentioning of when I inherited different things. As players would drop out of our game, very often they were friends of mine, that just didn't play anymore for whatever reason. They started working a different job, or they, they had a girlfriend, they just didn't have time anymore. Uh, those are the two main common things, and once in a while they get married. A lot of those guys just said, you know, I'm not going to be playing anymore, and I'd say, okay, I'll give you 20 bucks for your, your pile of stuff. And they'd say, sure, or in a couple of cases, they just said, hey, I'm not playing anymore, here you go, and they'd hand me their stuff. I inherited probably three full collections that way. That's one of the reasons I have a lot of lead figures is uh, I not only bought a lot during the uh, the time, my wife and I used to go lead figure shopping when she, we were just dating, she was my girlfriend. If we both had a day off together, we would jump in the car and go to the hobby store and we'd pick out lead figures and then go back home and paint them. Uh, it was part of the hobby that uh, she really enjoyed. I've never been a fan of painting. Uh, she was beautiful, uh, excellent painter. Uh, she doesn't paint anymore, unfortunately, but uh, back in the day, she was one of the best painters I ever saw. But uh, enough on that. I just wanted to take us back to 1982, October of 82 to be specific, in a very useful issue of The Dragon. The great thing about The Dragon at this time is every issue was useful. They weren't doing themes yet, so October issues later would become Halloween themed and, and such. And April issues would become April Fool's Day themed. Not a huge fan of the April Fool's. I like the Halloween stuff. But I have to admit, I like Dragon best when it was only... A section devoted to Halloween and the rest of the magazine was business as usual. They they started doing the specialty offerings in the 80s and or in the late 80s, early 90s, and that was when Dragon started to lose it, in my opinion. But that's it for today. Let me know what you think. Uh thank you for your time. Uh if you liked what you heard and saw, please like and subscribe. Uh thanks for joining me on this trip down memory lane, and I'll see you next time on page 121.